Hi, I'm Richard Fairgray. I'm the creator of Haunted Hill, Black Sand Beach, Cardboardia, Blastosaurus, Shed, Four Color Heroes, Ghost Ghost, a million other things. All my work is available on richardfairgray.com and I'm the only Richard Fairgray in the entire world. So just search that name. You'll find my Instagram, my Twitter, everything like that. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very prolific and talented comic creator. He has written over 250 plus books, and I'm sure he is not stopping anytime soon. You know his work from Haunted Hill, Black Sand Beach, Blastosaurus, and, and I'm sure many more that I haven't had a chance to look at yet. We're joined today by Richard Fergay. How are you doing today? I'm good. It's 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 early in the morning and I've been awake for like literally hours. So I'm kind of, I'm pumped for this. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you are all about. I make comics just obsessively. I make comics. That's all I, all I ever do. I started publishing books when I was seven and that was 30 years ago. And now I have hundreds and hundreds of books. I try to work at least 16 hours a day drawing pictures and writing stories and I do a range of things from like a lot of scary stories for kids uh, I grew up like desperately searching for things that were scarier and couldn't find anything scary enough the ideas and goosebumps were always scary enough but the actual stories were never scary enough for me yep. so like god just say cheese and die is such a cool <laughs> concept still wish I had my goosebumps calendar from 1997 but my mother did throw it out and then I also do a lot of like real dirtbag scumbag garbage comics for adults uh I did a memoir called Octopus which I briefly showed to people and then hid uh because it had too many fun sexy times in it and then now I do a weekly comic called Haunted Hill about a 35 year old woman navigating real life in Hollywood and just kind of being, as I describe her, a big human hot dog, appealing sloppy mess that you always end up having too much of and who is inexplicably everywhere in Hollywood, even though she clearly doesn't belong. Uh, we could dive into so many different genres and topics here today, but you know, Haunted Hill is one that kind of caught my interest. It was the one that is your more recent comic as well too and i got to read through it's a beautiful style it's a very interesting cast of characters that that is safe to say what were some of the themes haunted hill is i was missing hollywood desperately i i had to move to canada in the middle of the pandemic which was super fun i i'd been living in hollywood for four years it's my favorite place in the world it is the grindest place it is technically the worst and it's so exciting and fun to be there all of the time and Essentially, whenever I tell people about things that happened to me when I was living there, people look at me and say, oh my God, that sounds terrible. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing this wrong because I'm trying to tell you guys a delightful story about what made me so happy. Like when I say to you, oh yeah, no, there was a homeless guy who kept breaking into our house and shitting in our kitchen. Mm. I'm not saying it to be like, oh my God, isn't this terrible? I'm saying it to be like, I felt so vindicated because no one would believe me that it was human shit. And then he got arrested for doing it at the neighbor's place. And then they're like, why didn't you call the police? I'm like, because you should never call the police on people, obviously. You know, but I'm telling these stories to people and they're like, Richard, Hollywood sounds like a terrible place. I'm like, you're technically correct, but let me give you more information that will confirm that but also try and make it clear to you why i love it so much the first story in haunted hill is pretty closely based on a thing that happened to me right before covid i was walking home uh from my office and this car pulls up behind me and someone yells hey mark and i say yeah and i jump in the car and they're like you're not mark i'm like that is absolutely true what are we doing I'm, i was 33 at the time and i was 34 at the time and i was suddenly in a car full of 22 year old i was tired it was 11 o'clock at night and suddenly this thing that should have been me walking home turned into oh six hours later i'm teaching children how to break into a house because none of them know how to and along the way we went to a tire yard and we went and had donuts and like two different sets of couples broke up and i was like what I am so excited to be part of this storyline, but I am so exhausted and I don't want to be here anymore. There's something so fun about being an outsider who's completely enmeshed in a, in a, in a group. I want to try and create that feeling. So I think deep down, we all feel like we are outsiders. We're all, we are all weirdos. We are all, you know, alone in our own little personal journey, no matter how 
popular or normal other people may think we are i enjoy that aspect of things and i enjoy you know making comics sorry i slightly distracted my husband's wandering in past my my okay. mattress soundproofing situation to pour me coffee um and for some reason it's making me incredibly nervous even though it's just i mean spilled slightly thank you honey um hey now this I'm is using my sweater to mow coffee this is why i edit so it's all right it's all good oh there's no need to edit this this, <laughs> this is the kind of wonder of of you know, my comics are, I can write really tight stories about spooky things and create elaborate mysteries, or I can do a big brain dump of all my feelings onto a, onto a page in a big sloppy mess. And I, I like doing both. And I think there's value in both. And Haunted Hill is that. I got congratulated um, at a at a con by a an unpleasant man because he, he told me he really liked that he knew from the internet that I was a gay but uh, that I managed to not put it into any of my books. And I was like, bitch, Blastosaurus is an elderly homosexual who lives in a laundromat. Like, yes, it's a kid's comic about a crime-fighting dinosaur, but like, please understand the subtext. I have made all my comics incredibly gay, aggressively feminist in, in, in certain stories. And the, the willingness for people to like overlook that because they're enjoying a story and they're opposed to that and they're stupid little lines. So I thought, no, nah, I'm just going to make this one. To use the worst language in the world, I'm going to make this one a little bit more balls out. So Haunted Hill is about a, a big, sloppy 35-year-old woman who has moved back to Hollywood because her wife got a job at a museum. And at the heart of it all, she is one of those people who, if you've ever been to LA and you've met someone who actually was born there, they are such a special creature because they are 0.01% of the population. Everyone else there has moved there because they had big dreams or they were pretty enough in high school. I was not. I'm smarter than I am pretty is how I keep describing myself to people. The people who actually were from there have such a weird perspective because they're like, no, this is, this is who I am. This is where I'm from. No, I'm not part of it. And that disconnect is so exciting to me. It's like when you see a brand new building right next to a really old building and you're just like, oh, there's magic in the alleyway between it because those two things just shouldn't be next to each other. And your brain has to do a little bit of a trick to look at them at the same time. That's who Eva is. She is at home while being out of place. And now having been gone for 23 years, she's come back to this place because of insane kid logic. The other thing about Haunted Hill is that it's all kid logic. It's adult reactions, adult emotions, kid logic. So her wife got a really good job at a museum. Now, it's rare for someone of her age to get that kind of museum job, but since so many old white men have been being arrested for dressing up as monsters to scare tourists by wannabe Scooby-Doo gangs, uh, there are a lot of openings in museums in this world. There are no ghosts in Hollywood because they're all underground. The, the area Haunted Hill was a housing development owned by a guy named Obadiah Haunted, who named it after himself. In, in the book, the joke is, you know, it's like all areas of LA, they're, they're named after their, their founder, like Steve Silverlake or Ron Echo Park. Um, this is Obadiah Haunted's Haunted Hill. And he was a man who made his fortune being a vessel for ghosts that were exercised out of wealthy British children. And he moved to America with legs full of ghosts, uh, created most of our modern dance crazes, died and was buried on his own land. The ghosts have been leaking out ever since, and that's why Hollywood is so weird. It's just, there's a ghost energy underground. There are no ghosts in the story, by the way. Like, all of this is for nothing. There are no ghosts above ground. <laughs> I just like the idea <laughs> because of the movie House on Haunted Hill, mm -hmm. which should be called Haunted House on Regular Hill. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the house that is haunted and i wanted to know how a hill would get haunted. i was gonna say like it's it's the house on a slightly elevated piece of land <laughs> yeah <laughs> haunted house on elevated land yeah just didn't have the same ring to it you know like... <laughs> uh, looking at your, your your process as a creative person i think that it, it's always fascinating that you've done so many different things what is the hardest part about being a creative person the beginning the middle or the end of your process it honestly changes I have this, this way of working where I have to be obsessed with the thing I'm making or I just slow down. It always has to be a challenge. I don't want to call out any comics here because I'm not trying to shit on anyone. I'm saying like there are some comics where you'll look at them and you'll be like, oh, there's no background in these several pages. It's just some heads on a blank color. That must have been really fast for the artist to do. And I look at those and I think, oh, that looks like hell. Because if you give me a big complicated monster or like incredibly dense settings with trees and bricks and gravel and whatever else, 
I will sit there and I will be like, I'm on this page, on this page for like the next nine years. And I will just sit here and do it until it's done. I will not even think about breathing until it is finished. If you give me a page that's like four panels, no backgrounds, one head in each panel saying something, I'm like, well, I'm so bored. I cannot look at this page and it will take me like a thing that should take technically like an hour will take me a full day because I just hate it so much. It's getting into that obsessive mode that that is the hardest part. There's always a fear, the build up to the first page. You've got the script ready. You've got the idea ready. And it's like the first page of a new sketchbook. If, mm -hmm. if you fuck this one up, then you've ruined your, your whole book. I have a friend who has a, a thing where he says he always just scribbles something on the first page of a sketchbook so that it's ruined from the jump, which I'd like to apply to other things. Like, do you also crash your car just a little bit as soon as you buy it? Um, actually, you should. I remember I had a friend who bought his first ever new car after he retired, and he was so paranoid about it getting even a little bit scratched. Ruined his whole day, every day. And then one day he just backed into a planter. <laughs> 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 and he was like, I'm never fixing it. I'm good now. I'm happy. That very beginning part. And then usually the last page takes a long time because A, I'm tired. And two, I know that the next thing has to start tomorrow. And that is terrifying because all I'm thinking is I really want a day off. I haven't had one in 400 years and I'm not going to get one before I have to change my entire mindset to get into that new thing. So the last page always takes a grip to do. And the first page always takes a grip to do. That middle part, unless it's easy. Unless it's boring, uh, that middle part I'm singing. I, I have to ask then, and this is kind of out of morbid curiosity, how many un unfinished scripts and pages do you have? Unfinished? No, none. Oh, God. I don't stop making stuff ever. There was a point where, um, let's say I was going through a bit of a darker time. This is like seven years ago. I'd lost a big pile of money. I'd gotten divorced and moved countries kind of without warning, without making a good decision behind it. I'd been living in a hotel with this like billionaire surfing philanthropist who turned out to maybe be a pedophile, which was a big surprise to me, but he sort of revealed some stuff on a bus trip to a zoo. And I was like, oh, I'm going to dip out of this friendship. My, my life was kind of in chaos. I'd been taking a bath and dropped a bottle of mouthwash in it. And then all my body hair fell out and I had ingrown hairs everywhere. It was just a bad time. What was the question? No, uh, <laughs> it was just kind of a bad time. And so I was like, well, I better like start working. I have a tattoo that just says, don't cry work. I made 30 children's books and it took about seven months. I didn't color them. They are just, they were just drawn and scanned and, and letter. Um, and picture books are fast to make if, you know, you can do some very cool stuff with very, very little uh, actual drawing. But I made 30 of them and I was like, there you go. Now I have enough work that I can sustain myself for the rest of my life if I want to. And it gave me this like sense of security. Even if I just sell one of these a year, that's my income. I can, I can retire at, at 30. And uh, then I, I freaked out. I was like, well, that's a bad idea. So I <laughs> burned all the pages and deleted all the files. So now those will never be seen by anyone. Being an, uh, a creative person is a struggle sometimes. But I mean, that seems like you kind of went off the deep end for a second. I'm burning all your page. I think I get really annoyed at the idea of false value. You know, mm. like this is the comics are an industry built on false value, like the entire collector's market of, oh, I don't buy this to read. I buy it. So it might become worth something one day. And you're like, well, it's still, it's nothing though. Sh just stop it. I see GC this book. Cool. You made it uglier. What a good decision. It really, it gets under my skin when I see people who are buying things, not because they love them or buying things that other people do love and making them cost more money so that people who actually love them can't get them. I don't tend to sell my comic pages very often, but when I do, it's either like, I'll put them online for a very, very reasonable price based on how many hours it took me to do them and no more, or I will give them to children at conventions. Because, you know, when I was 16, I went on uh, eBay because I got the internet for the first time. And like realize, oh, dip, all of these things that I really like, I can actually buy pieces of because they're cheap. Now I go and look at those kind of same things. I, I don't want them anymore because I'm not 16 and my taste slightly changed, but they're not cheap anymore. They're like, oh, that, that thing that I paid, you know, $75 for back then, which keep in mind the artist who I was buying it from had already been paid their page rate for the drawing of it and all of that. And I don't want to take money away from artists or anything like that, but this was not the artist selling their work. And it almost never is now the artist selling their work. If you're buying work from an artist, pay whatever they want for it. When I see a story about this comic book cover just sold for $15,000, I'm like, okay. Well, I'd love a picture of it. I'll, I'd probably pay 20 bucks to have a, a, a copy of it on my wall. The value of it being the actual original, the value of it somehow being more special, 
without any of that value going to the artist and without any of that enjoyment being available anymore to the people it was created for. My thoughts on this are complicated and messy and I don't have answers. As a result of this, I tend to pretty often destroy a lot of, of my own stuff. All of the stuff is hand-drawn, it's all on paper and it all exists digitally, so I don't need to have it anymore. Also, I don't like being weighed down by... I was 31, I was living in New Zealand. I've been living in, my, in New Zealand my whole life at that point. And I was doing a convention and it was like a four, four day show. I had my my 206th book had just come out. And I was thinking, oh, cool, same number of bones. My booth was like 60 feet wide and 20 feet deep. And I had a private lounge area for my staff. And I had a giant fucking screen playing these two mobile phone games designed based on my characters. And there was an action figure of Blastosaurus uh, with zero points of articulation. Probably an inaction figure, I guess. What was I doing? Like I was, I was in New Zealand and couldn't go anywhere or do anything bigger than that. Uh, and so the next day I brought in everything I owned uh, to the show and every I told my staff, like, all books are one dollar now. Every book that sells comes with a personal item of mine. And we sold out of books and I walked out of there with, like, a big tub of cash and, like, a plastic skeleton that I really liked and, uh, like, six pairs of shoes and some underwear. I think a couple of t-shirts. And then... I went to the airport and said, like, one America ticket, please, and flew to LA and lived there instead. And because I was like, I need to not be weighed down by things. Because anytime you're trying to make a decision, should I take this big risk? If the thing you're leaving behind is a person you care about or a lifestyle you enjoy, that's one thing. If the thing you're leaving behind is stuff, <laughs> like, then ditch it. I don't think I own anything that I couldn't walk away from. There are certainly things I've owned in my life that I look back on and think, oh man, it'd be fun to look at that thing again. But like knowing it existed is enough. And my friend Barbara just sent me a, a birthday gift. I got this water bottle. It is Snoopy themed. I don't care about Snoopy, but it is a Snoopy themed water bottle with a Bluetooth speaker in the top. Mm -hmm. for when you're, you know, jogging and need some sick tunes, I guess. That's one of my favorite objects right now because, like, how many people had to say yes to that for that stupid thing to exist? Hey, guys, we need to revolutionize the water bottle. What are we going to do? Am I wrong? Is you know, Like, it, it yes, feels no. like that's nothing. But I love that no one had the, had the goal to say, or we could just leave it as a water bottle that functions perfectly well. Like, oh, cool, I'm listening to my favorite. Use headphones. Stop it. Like... <laughs> Oh man, I can't go for a run today. I forgot to charge my water bottle. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, we're we're making things worse with these garbage things. And and I sort of I, I love looking at that and thinking about all of those disconnections. But I also would not have a problem with being like, hey Richard, there's a fire. You're gonna lose your Snoopy water bottle Bluetooth speaker. <laughs> like, okay, that's quite all right. As long as I get out alive, I'm good. As a creative person, not only as as a writer and an artist, what is the most important quality in comics today, and how does that translate to what you've created in your lifetime so far? I think that there's a lot of stuff going on in comics at the moment that is very good. A lot of stuff that's going on that's very bad. It's always the way it's been. The driving force behind all of it is just people making comics that are good, people doing new and different things, people using the medium for anything. Whenever someone gets mad about one type of comic or another type of comic, and this is this is from both sides. And by the way, you know, keep in mind, I am out here making super gay comics and scary comics and weird comics. And I clearly have a pretty strong agenda with my work. And if someone complains about my work being what it is, I want them to, you know, eat my whole butt because <laughs> that's nonsense. But at the same time, if someone who makes works like work like mine says man, there's too many tits on Kickstarter. I'm like, well, then balance it out. Make something that isn't tits on Kickstarter. That's fine too. The number of times that I have been like, I'm tired of these, like, I don't want to look at big tits on Kickstarter. I don't care, but I want to see, you know, overweight men in their 60s in their underwear. That would be a great comic for me. Like lemonparty.org is a fantastic website that I miss dearly, but no one's making that. So I will. Or I'll go find it in real life. That's also fine. Just make more comics. That's all it ever comes down to for me. And the most important part of it is the actual comics themselves. Yeah, and it's that, no, let's, let's stop having the fake values. Like, NFTs are garbage and terrible. And everyone who's against them is right. And everyone who is hoping that they'll have some actual benefit with the technology somehow later is kidding themselves. I mean, that's the other thing is I'm always very willing to be wrong. Comics need to stop getting stuck in places. I don't know what the most important thing in comics is right now. I know what things I like the most. I know what things 
I want to make the most. I have a friend who hates comic books. He makes them and he hates them. And he's angry that people are so stuck. He's angry that people are caring about buying the new Batman or what happens to Superman this week. And he thinks that that's all terrible and it would be legitimately better if comics were completely destroyed and started over and everyone had little group, 10 people who they got together and shared books with. And I disagree with him, but I like that his opinion's out there. And I like that he's making like weird essay driven comics about, you know, who is the true artist behind the Simpsons thing, the blues. I think it's really fucking exciting and wonderful that we are now 80 years into Batman existing and a kid can talk to his great grandparents about Batman and they all have their own story. Every version of it is cool. It would be great if someone was like, what are comics? Oh, they're this thing that little groups of people make all over the world and no one ever gets to see them and they're a cool mystery that's out there. Mm-hmm. Or what are comics? It's the store that you go to where you buy pictures of a man wearing a mask and a cape and you talk to your grandparents about it. Everything in between that is amazing. The thing I'm really fascinated by right now is that, and I don't know if anyone else is doing much with it, and I wish more people would, because I'd love to see other people's takes on it. Comics are a medium where you can control time. You know, a movie plays out at the rate that it plays out. Obviously, the remote control has changed that a little, but like movies play at the speed they play. Books pass at the rate they pass. You know, you read them at the speed you read. A single minute of film is always a minute of film. A page of a book is always a page of a book. A page of a comic can take 10 times as long to read as another page. The writer has control of that with how many panels they say are going to be in it or how much dialogue they say is going to be in it and the artist has control of that by how they arrange the panels or the size of the panels or the amount of detail in those panels because those pages where it's four panels of heads on blank backgrounds of people saying some stuff that I hate drawing the most frustrating part is they take longer to draw because I hate them and they take less time to read because no one's stopping to go oh dip what's that in the background there another cool math joke Richard put in I have one cool math joke I just keep putting it into everything because no one's mentioned it yet and I'm hoping someone knows is that it's not even a good joke it's just that if you follow the equation the answer looks like a penis <laughs> that's all it is it's just eight equals d <laughs> i'm interested on your your answer for this then what was an early experience where you learned that language had power <laughs> the first time i got in trouble <laughs> i wrote a story when I was three years old. I I went through this phase where I was like, I want to make books. My parents were really insistent that I had to learn to read and write before I started kindergarten. Kindergarten starts when you're four in New Zealand. So I had to know how to read and write before I went in because they were like, otherwise you'll be behind. Spoiler, you would not be behind. I'd learned to read and write. I have a very good memory. And so my mother would read me a book and then I would be able to read that book to myself immediately afterwards because I'd know every word in order. And then I could start figuring out what each word was. And I knew the alphabet, so I was able to start putting together, well, what do these sounds do? How does it, you know, I, I essentially, because of my memory, was able to teach myself to read. Because of that, I started writing. I'd watch other people writing. And I'm left-handed, and so I'd see other people who were right-handed reaching across the page to write. So I would start writing backwards, because I thought that was how it worked, because, you know, I was an idiot. And I wrote a story. I got some pieces of paper, and I taped them together. I was also firmly under the impression that if something looked like something, it was something, which is why I genuinely thought that When I found out how much my dad's leather wallet cost, I thought that if I got a bunch of brown pens and colored in pieces of paper, I would be able to create my own leather and sell it for an enormous profit. (laughs) Um, It didn't work. The paper just gets kind of soggy and curly and the pens run out before you've colored in one sheet. I got some pieces of paper and taped them together and I was like, well, now that's how long my book will be. And I wrote a story about Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse were meant to meet up to go and explore a haunted house together. I'm very embarrassed that I misspelled house. Donald Duck goes to the haunted house, waits for Mickey. Mickey doesn't show up. Donald realizes that Mickey's not really his friend, so he goes into the house on his own. He gets to the of the house and finds a ghost. And the ghost is sad because he's lonely and has no friends. Donald has no friends either, so then he takes out his gun and shoots himself in the face so that he can stay and be a ghost and be friends with the ghost forever. Hmm. And, oh boy, people got, like, my grandmother read it, she got very upset. My parents read it, they got very upset. I was so delighted by this that I kept it. I was told that, like, I shouldn't be writing stories like that. They were worried about me. Was I sad? They, I didn't know what suicide was. I was like, he just shot himself in the face to be a ghost, like a cool person would, because ghosts are cool. Um, and they, they all thought I was, like, depressed and whatever. And I, I genuinely wasn't. I was like, that's just, a, it's a logical thing. 
he can stay and be friends with a ghost, which we all want, really. Like, can you imagine a world where you wake up every day knowing that you're... I never understand people who don't believe in ghosts, how they get out of bed in the morning. Because if you genuinely don't think you're going to become friends with a ghost that day, why would you do anything? Like, if that's never a, a possibility for you, then what's the point? The amount of attention I was getting, I was like, this is incredible. I should write stories forever. And I think it's probably also why I write so many sad stories about ghosts to this very day. <laughs> I just want my parents to notice me. <laughs> I think we all want that no matter what we're doing, like, which is probably why I've been doing this for as long. But no, my, my parents are fine. They, they don't understand the technology side of things, but they're like, so who are you talking to today? Oh, I'm talking to this amazingly talented, you know, New Zealand artist in Canada that, you know, does all this cool stuff. And they're like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> what? They don't know who I am. Well, they suck. <laughs> I, I love that, um, you know, when you're talking to anyone over 45, I think at this point, or anyone who kind of like didn't come up with the internet, mm -hmm. who hasn't seen the fracturing of culture, where now I can be really into a band and I can go and see them at a show and it can be a sold out show at like a modestly sized venue. And then I can talk to someone my own age with a similar cultural background to me and similar cultural well to be pulling from for what their Spotify playlist should look like. And they'll have no idea who I'm talking about. That's fine and normal. It doesn't detract anything from the person who I went to see in concert. Whereas if I say to my husband is older than me, because as I mentioned, lemonparty.org was my favorite website. Don't visit it while we're talking. You can visit it later. <laughs> this was a fun internet trick from the past where you trick people to, to going and looking at a website that was three old dudes having a threesome. And <laughs> that's a story for another day. I was talking to my husband and, and I, was, I was listening to Carly Rae Jepsen. He said, oh, huh, you know who she is? I was like, yeah, he goes, oh, she was kind of a one hit wonder. I was like, no, she wasn't. Like, she's consistently released absolute, like, bangers. And I think she's great. He had heard that one song and then not heard anything else. So because it wasn't on the station he was listening to or the station, whatever algorithm was recommending music to him, he just thought that she disappeared. And, and I think that's like a mindset that older people have that is different because for younger people, because we, I'm not a younger person, I'm 37, I'm basically shuffling toward my tomb, but we know that just because we haven't heard of something doesn't mean that like literally millions of other people ha haven't. I'm sure there are people out there who have no idea what, what my chemical romance sound like. And I just tried to do a pull of like a modern hip band. And my first one was my chemical, <laughs> my chemical romance. romance. Yeah. That's a little bit. Here's back the then. thing. Like I was, I was old enough when they kind of blew up big that mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is for young people. This is not music for me. And like, by the way, I love their music, but I yeah. always felt like I'm going to be the tallest person at their concert. I can't go, by the way. Oh, there's a story. I discovered this singer named Cave Town. And I was like, this music rules. This is the wimpiest music I've ever heard. Like he's literally singing one of his songs. I've just turned 14 and I think this year I'm going to be mean. Like I'm not very strong, but I'll fuck you up if you're mean to bugs. He sings songs about his goldfish being his best friend. And I was like, what great ironic music this <laughs> clearly adult man is doing. And then I saw that he was performing uh, nearby and, and tickets on StubHub for that night were $6. Called out my dear friend Alex and I said, let's go see Cave Town, that musician I've been playing you all the time. He was like, yeah, let's definitely do that. And we got there and, oh boy, we walked in. Alex is five foot four mm -hmm. and I'm 5'11", so I'm like, you know, adult size, but he's five foot four and he was the second tallest person in that room because we had accidentally bought tickets to an actual children's concert and in between the opening act and the main act, they didn't play the usual playlist for the theater. They played the SpongeBob SquarePants <laughs> album and everyone sang along. And we were like, this is a bad scene for us to be at. Let's go to the rooftop bar and watch it on a screen instead. End of that story is that we did go downstairs for the encore and the whole place was empty because children don't know what encores are. <laughs> <laughs> so we did get like a private concert. Everything is fractured. Everything is, is disconnected and our parents will never know what we do. We will just understand it like, oh, you do that thing? Never heard of it. Probably very popular. <laughs> as long as we mention at some point that Haunted Hill comes out every Wednesday. What's your hot dog thing? I mean, so, that sounds totally like a really hot dog. <laughs> How, how's your hot wait no that's that's not. do you remember years ago there was that that the campaign for share a coke with 
So I noticed that, that none of the bottles said Richard Fairgray, which seemed like an oversight. So I started producing stickers that just said my, my full name on them and putting them on Coke bottles in, every time I was in a store. And then I started giving them to fans at conventions to do the same. I just give them a sheet of stickers and say, please go and you know correct your local grocery store by putting my name on all the Coke bottles. My hope being that people would bring me bottles of Coke. And it worked. Fucking worked. People started bringing me bottles of Coke at conventions. Awesome. And it ruled. This was back in New Zealand. When I caught to America, I got really, I, I'm a big hot dog fan. Like I love them. They're delicious. I love those sloppy meat tubes. And my favorite thing about going to conventions, especially like LA Comic Con, is there's so many hot dog vendors outside. But the process of like leaving the convention to go and just buy three hot dogs for lunch is pretty challenging because then you have to go back through all the security. So I was like, well, what if I could set up a situation where people would bring hot dogs to me? So I started making sure that every time I was photographed, I would always be eating a hot dog. <laughs> and I would just be going to town on these suckers. And I will never be able to eat the most hot dogs. Like I'm no Joey Chestnut. I will never be able to do 75 in 10 minutes. What I think I could do is eat one hot dog better than anyone else. I've been trying to kind of perfect that art. I thought if I do this enough, people will know well, we want to bring Richard something, and he clearly likes the, this mustard mess. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. By the way, no ketchup. I am allergic to tomatoes. It will kill me, but mustard. Mustard and onions all day, every day. Of course, it didn't work, because what I forgot was that you cannot bring a big sloppy hot dog through security at LA Comic Con. <laughs> but what did happen, and this happened three times from three different people, I started getting hot dogs sent to me in the mail. No. So it was over a course of four months, three hot dogs turned up at my office. My address is very public, 6671 West Sunset Boulevard, building 1509, Suite 106, Los Angeles, California, 90028. And these rank old, soggy envelopes with a messy mustard-covered hot dog inside them. I mean, one of them, the, the postman literally jammed it through the mail slot of my door, and so it just came through kind of squeezed. And I will be honest, like I got massively butt sick from eating them, like massively. So it wasn't like a good idea. I mentioned it in an interview a while back that it had happened. And my publicist was like, hey, Richard, you probably need to do this more. And I was like, well, we need to promote this new book. And I do describe Eva as a human hot dog. So why don't I just open the floodgates and say, if anyone sends me a hot dog, I will send them a copy of Haunt, a physical copy of Haunted Hill issue one with a drawing on the back cover. These are rare as shit. I, I got them printed up as a little sample. They're never going to be for sale anywhere. If you want one, the only way to get it is to send me a hot dog. <laughs> That's going on right now. My plan was be in the office to get them fresh. <laughs> mm. And my travel plans got changed. And so now I'm not in Hollywood. I'm in Canada. And so the hot dogs, I have to assume, are piling up in my office. And so when I get back there in June, I'm going to have a bad day. You should ask him to like freeze dry it or something like that. So he can. No, I want them fresh. I want a cooked hot dog. Here's the thing. I used to buy a bucket of chicken from, from KFC uh, every Sunday night. And I would eat that stuff for breakfast and lunch every day for the rest of the week. I'd buy 40 pieces of chicken and it would last me seven days. And it was a good way to live. I did also weigh 350 pounds, but I think that might've been a coincidence. People would always say to me like, Richard, how can you keep KFC for seven days? Doesn't it go bad? I was like, I've never gotten sick from it. And so I started getting curious. What if, I wonder how long I could keep it before it would make me sick. And so each time I would keep one piece longer and each week I would extend it by one day to see how long it would take until the chicken made me ill. And I did get to 63 days. And I ate a 63 day old piece of KFC. And by the way, it had gone basically clear. It looked like fiber optic cables when you <laughs> peeled it apart. Oh my God. Like I finished the whole piece, but I did have to eat the second half of it on the turlet just for safety. I've got a pretty tough gut. I don't think hot dogs go bad. I think onions go bad. I don't think that dirty processed meat can get worse. It's bad to start with. And I love it. Have you seen the movie Pet Cemetery? <laughs> uh, yeah. Which version? The original. Yeah. Do you remember her sister in the attic? Mm-hmm. And her, her, like, the gross bones pushing through her back and the red hair draped across it and how it looked exactly like a piece of Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> I cannot watch that movie without being like, I've got to be eating KFC right now, though, because I'm so hungry looking at her back. I will not think about anything else until I get some KFC in the face hole Whoa. because, God damn, her spine looks like Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I don't think that was what they intended, but it's there was a commercial on New Zealand television that was an anti-smoking commercial. The whole thing was like, this it would show this like mortician cutting up a body. And it was in like the dirtiest operating theater ever, because I think they were trying to be scarier. And they cut out this piece of it and they go, this is an artery cut from a smoker. And they slice it open 
and they push out with their like gloved finger all of this like thick white goo and they say he was 24 years old there was also a candy at the time called fabulicious sherbet fizz was a sort of a raspberry licorice tube with thick gunky white sherbet in it and i could not see that commercial without having to be like i gotta go get one of those right now because like my mouth is watering it sounds like stephen king did product placement without even realizing it before product placement was a thing in films <laughs> love it i love the idea oh yeah this is sponsored by kentucky fried chicken look at this lady's back <laughs> You want some ribs? Yeah. Chicken ribs. If you go to KFC and you have the choice, say, I want the ribs. It's the driest piece of the chicken and it absorbs the most flavor. I did not know that. I'm, I'm learning new things about culinary uh, delights of KFC. You're welcome. <laughs> what was an underappreciated author or comic that you read that didn't get enough credit in your early to mid years? That is a tough question because of growing up in New Zealand, there were four comic stores. You know, I didn't actually see a comic physically in person until I was 16 years old. And so the stuff that got to us was like pretty obvious, you know, that we weren't really finding these weird little underground things. It was like, okay, well, here's some Alan Moore stuff and some Neil Gaiman stuff. And then a plethora of Batman stories. And so you kind of get like tricked into thinking that comics are either really amazing or really mediocre. And there wasn't really much in between. I mean, like, we were so excited when, like, Brian Michael Bendis blew up because he was kind of, like, the first new thing that New Zealand noticed for some reason. The things that I really, like, glommed onto as a kid were just on TV. They were popular already, you know? I, I don't know if The Simpsons has ever been underappreciated. I don't know if Ninja Turtles has ever been underappreciated. I do think that, like, there's some cool, like, early works of different creators that are that I really love. I think I would have been, like, 12 or 13 when New Zealand got Dr. Katz about four years after it started. And that, that show was incredible. For there to be a show on actual television on one of our four channels that was just technically funny and not really much better than that was such a delight to me. A show where people squiggled instead of moving and there was characters who actually just told jokes, like just old classic let me tell you a joke in a bar type joke was kind of mind-blowing. I, I really loved that. The show that followed that was Home Movie, which was Brendan Small's squiggle vision nightmare that became Flash Animation for season two. It's just about two eight-year-olds and a seven-year-old who made movies. Um, and it was loosely scripted and mostly improvised and then animated. And it was so quiet and so small and so good. And it was kind of before things like Family Guy blew up and South Park was around. But it was when adult animated comedies could be small and not yelling at you and telling you when to laugh. And I really, really enjoyed that stuff. There's some pretty amazing animation back in, in the 90s and, and especially late night animation, like mm. Eon Flux or Aeon Flux. That was good animation. That yeah. was the difference. Like that was like home movies was garbage. <laughs> it looked like it had been made for $4. It was like they looked at Blair Witch Project and said, how could we be worse? That was part of the delight. My whole kind of philosophy on everything now, when people talk about art being good, most of the time, I mean, there's no such thing as good. But when people say good, what they mean is realistic or accurate. I'm like, guys, we have photography. Like, we don't have to draw things to look like they look anymore. <laughs> stop it you can use your pen or your whatever to do something new and interesting something no one's ever seen before or just something that would be better exaggeration stop thinking about what looks right i hate this phrase now of like everyone has an ipad everyone is using procreate the one that people use to draw comics clip studio it's fine to use those every tool is great like I, i'm a big supporter of like this Susan Sontag idea, like zines shouldn't stay zines. They should use everything available to them to be the best thing they can be. And I don't want to be old man yelling at cloud about this. If you learn to draw on paper with a pen and a, a fucking mechanical pencil, because it's ooh, gross, who wants to sharpen things? Then you have to learn to deal with your fuck ups. If you draw a line wrong, that line is there forever and you have to incorporate it into the picture. If you draw on an iPad with a stylus, then you can always double tap to undo. And then you can keep doing it until the line is correct. And that's fine when you've done it for a long time. When you are experienced as a drawer, you can do that and maybe create some cool stuff. But if that's how you learn to draw, then you never have to actually learn. You never have to learn to adapt or create something cool. You can always do something that's technically right. And by and large, pretty boring. Like when you talk about like Aeon Flux or, I mean, Aeon Flux was on in New Zealand on the same block of animation as Pond Life. I don't know if anyone else remembers Pond Life, but it was essentially squiggly stick figures. You know, it's why I love the first season of Doug before it got all like picked up by Disney. 
because that first season was sloppy as shit. Yeah. You know, as told by Ginger, every character was off model all of the time. But my God, they could do some cool storytelling. And I don't mean just that they had good scripts. I mean, the visual storytelling was astonishing. Compare early Simpsons to current Simpsons, this mm. flat, dead corpse of a show that we're looking at, frozen in time, <laughs> as opposed to like, Bart versus Thanksgiving from season one or two or whatever, where it's like, oh, we're just going to do some cool surrealist shit. We're going to try something new. We're going to like spin out of control here and just, it's not going to look right, but we're going to get a point across. We're going to create a mood. That's so much better. Yeah. It's amazing what they could get away with because no one was really paying attention to it in the early eighties and nineties and into the two thousands. It was one of those things where you could push the envelope until someone caught you basically. But beyond, like, yes, politically and what have you, yes. And they could do some, I mean, Jesus, that show used to have actual courage. (laughs) My God, I'm sure there's enough people on the internet complaining about The Simpsons (laughs) and I'm not an expert. I have not watched it since probably season 14 or something. Uh, Yeah, I'm the same. Every time I see something about The Simpsons, it always feels like Al Jean is slowly deflating and apologizing for existing and just hoping that no one notices. I don't care. You know, I used to care about this show, these people. It's the same, like the energy of music, you know, back in the, I think the best, the best time for music is when everyone can create cool stuff. And there was this period in the nineties that really fascinated me that I was too young to really, you know, I was not a part of this or anything. And now I am becoming like nostalgic for a thing I wasn't part of. Friends of mine were in it where you would play a show somewhere on the sunset strip. And then someone would ask you, do you have a demo? And you would lie and say, yes. And then you would go into Larchmont and there would be all of these recording studios for like Korean run English language type things. And you could rent them for 40 bucks for the night and you could record a demo and it would be shitty, but you just do it. You just have the music and you do it. And then in the morning you could deliver it to this, whichever record label it was. And then maybe your career would be made overnight and maybe it wouldn't, but all you'd lost was one night and making some cool stuff. And now it can take nine months to make a song because people have bought into the idea that there is an idea of what sounds technically correct. And it's not sloppy and it's not interesting because it can be polished. And it's really hard when you're creating something to not look at it and say, but I could fix that. When I'm coloring things digitally, oh my God, like zooming in on my line work. I want to like write a letter to every person who's ever bought one of my books and say, hi, I'm really sorry I tricked you into buying this because this is garbage. But it's not garbage. I just have to look at it from further away. You know, it doesn't matter if there are some little fuck ups here and there or some like occasionally some ghosting lines from pencils that have failed to remove. That's not what the comic is about. And it's really hard to hold that perspective when you are looking at something digitally that you can zoom in like a microscope and see everything that's wrong. And you can make something polished and smooth and perfect. And eventually what we will end up with is everything is an orb. We will be a happy world of floating orb with no edges or corners or rough parts. And we'll all look at each other and go, we're perfect. We're perfect now. We're good. We did it. And something will be missing and something will be sad. That's my new sci-fi original. Uh, he has a sci-fi original because it sounds like a sci-fi original movie. Orb NATO balls from space. We look at other people's work and we say, that's perfect. I can't do that. I can't draw like Alex Ross. That's fine. He already does. I can't draw like Lee Chan. That's fine. She already does. She does amazing coloring. She does digital work that's fucking mind-blowingly good. Captures mood and tone. Also, she draws everything with pencil on paper first. That's how you do. But I mean, the things I like, my favorite comic of all time is The Alcoholic. That's a big sloppy mess, as it should be. No, no, it was good. I know. I, I, I liked what you said. I, I think it's, it's all valid. It's, and it's definitely something that not a lot of people really kind of take the time to think about when it comes to what they're currently watching. They just, I think people consume for the sake of consuming media. So mm-hmm. it's just, it gets to the point where do you actually understand what you're watching and act- actively think about it or just watching a show because someone recommended it to you and you just need to waste an hour or two of your day. And I, I think like, it's fine. You know, I am not going to get on my high horse about it. I'm eight seasons deep into One Tree Hill right now. Boy, that show really fell off a cliff. It was actually pretty good for the first four. Media is there for several different reasons. Sometimes it is just filler and sometimes that's nice. What I don't like is when people like champion the filler as being things that it's not, or when people think it should be. You know, it's the same reason I get asked from time to time, will you be in this gallery show with your comic art? I'm like, no, that's not where comics go, idiot. <laughs> like, you're confused. Can you put a page of your comic on this wall? Why? It's meant to be in a book, along with like 23 other pages. Why would I put it alone on a wall? 
<laughs> Did it get left behind like that one wildebeest at the end of the Lion King stampede? Why would I want my comic to be that? Oh, we can sell it for a thousand dollars. I'm like, yeah, or you could not. I'm gonna go give this to a child now because you're an idiot. Yeah, Some right. of my work I cannot give to children. All of Blastosaurus, super family friendly. Ghost Ghost also super family friendly. That was my first ever comic. Uh, it's about a ghost who struggles with invisibility and loneliness. I published it when I was seven and now a collected edition of it is coming out this year from uh, Stack Deck Press. Oh, which is weird, like 30 years later, is coming out in printed form for, I guess, a very small audience because it's a small queer publisher. But like, still, I have it at conventions and be like, you want to buy this big, heavy brick of a thing? Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Uh, I mean, I have wax poetic about this a lot over the years. I, I like to not live with any kind of like regret. I regret not seeing whole live. I'm resentful that I never had a mentor. When I was a kid, I saved up all my money to buy all four Ninja Turtles because I thought that was the correct thing to do, but only so I could then buy Master Splinter. And so he and I could spend time together. And I put the turtles in a wheelbarrow on the other side of the room and said they were off having a fight somewhere. And then Master Splinter and I would hang out and have great conversations and I'd take off his kimono. There are people who have been very bad for me and put me on very bad paths. And there are people who have seen what I can do on my own and try to latch on to it, you know, see my co-writer from 15 to 30 for that one. Um, there have been friends who have pulled me out of things and there have been people who have done those good things for me and then turned out to be bad for other reasons. But I, I haven't, I haven't really had one, you know, it, 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 there's, there, there's no one I can point to and say, okay, this, this guy here was the person who, called me and said do you want to move to australia and live with me because we've been chatting on the internet and you know fallen deeply in love and yes he was the person who introduced me to people where he worked fox uh who optioned books of mine to be made into other comics and things like that and that's really good but it's also like well no i he didn't make those things happen he made the me having a relationship with him happen uh for fun sexy times and because I went to work with him one day, I made other introductions. So yeah, incredibly grateful to him. But like, no, I, have, I haven't, I've had no one guide me in that. Like, maybe I don't need it. Maybe no one needs it. Maybe we buy into the hero's journey a little too much. I mean, someone the other day was ranting about how sick they are of seeing people reject the call to adventure for no reason. Uh, and it's true. I wish I'd had a mentor and I didn't. And I'm, I, I will probably go to my grave mad about it. <laughs> No matter how, how well I'm doing, how many books I have, how much money I make, I'm always thinking I could be doing better if I could time travel and just go back and say, Richard, stop it with this nonsense, do this one and say, what if I'd made, like, what if I'd made Black Sand Beach 20 years earlier and then I could be making 20 years better comics now? That's stupid. It's a stupid way to think, but it's, it's what haunts me at night. I'm not working fast enough. This time. I mean, you, you've, you've put a lot together and you're continuing to put a lot together. And that kind of segues into my next question here, which is from a professional standpoint, you've created over 250 plus comics and works and books and everything along that line. You are 30 plus years into your career now. And that's an amazing accomplishment from a professional standpoint that you're doing what you love and you're passionate about. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Some days. Um... I can look at where I am and compare it to where I used to be and say, like, I've done incredibly well. I'm, I'm making better work than I've ever made. Uh, and other days, no, other days I'm zooming in on my stuff to color it and saying, Richard, you're a, you're a gym holding a pen. I don't think Haunted Hill is a perfect book by any means, because, again, I don't think there is such a thing. But it's the exact book I wanted to make. Actually, since I since I finished the first series, the first run of it uh, back in January, it's, it's been a little bit hard for me to be motivated with a lot of stuff because I'm like, well, I finished. I made comics already. Like, without realizing it, that was the thing that I'd been trying to do for 30 years, and I made it. You know, now, right now, I'm trying to find what the new thing is that I'll be obsessed with. I've got a script that I wrote last year that I'm drawing, which I think is very good. I'm really excited about it. And I'm putting a lot of time into this one that I, I don't usually put into things. I'm, I'm actually, I'm drawing like less than a page a day on this book that no one's paying me to do. <laughs> I don't know what success looks like. I know the feeling, you know, it's that 
I've got too much blood in my body feeling the, the I can't stop jumping because I'm so excited. It's that like success for me is, is having a new good idea. Every time I get a new idea, I feel different. People always associate certain drugs with certain professions, right? And I've done a bunch of different drugs in my life. I've never done anything regularly. The drug that I hate the most is cocaine because it gives you this feeling. It's the exact same physical sensation of having a good idea or getting good news. And I really, really understand why people get hooked on it because I know that if I have a good idea today and I don't have anything new tomorrow, tomorrow will be a really, really hard day. If I have good ideas two days in a row, that third day is really hard. And if you need that feeling, if you get successful in, in, in film or music or you know in the entertainment industry and you are successful because you've had good ideas, that is a feeling you're really connected to. And when you get real successful, people say, hey, you want to try some Coke? It's on this toilet seat at this fun party because that's what success looks like. And then you take it and you're like, this feels like a good idea. I can have that good idea every day. This is not an anti-drug PSA. Success feels like a good idea. So if you ask me right after I've had one, then yeah, I'm incredibly successful. But if you ask me any other time, I feel like I am just flailing. Yeah. Dopamine's a, a bitch too, so. <laughs> yep. I'm a little bit lucky. I have a, the reason that I'm how I am, um, I don't know if, I'm, if I've mentioned this to you at all. I'm, I'm legally blind. So I've got one dead eye and then one eye that sees about 3% of what a normal eye can see. Mm -hmm. And it's because the nerves aren't connected to the back of the eyeball properly. And it's because I have two really, one really common condition and one really rare condition. The really common condition is that you get these cracks in your eyeballs when you're a fetus. And then the really rare condition is that my brain doesn't go into sleep pattern. I release like serotonin, dopamine, melatonin all at once, all of the time. There's no cycles to it. My brain didn't go into sleep patterns. So the eyeballs didn't heal. It also means that I process images incredibly fast. So while I am unable to see most things, if you point somewhere and say, look at that, I, it'll take me a second for my eye to wobble into the right place to have taken a picture of that for me. But instead of seeing 15 to 25 frames a second, I'm seeing around 400 frames a second, uh, depending which doctor I talk to who explains it to me. But it also means that I, I don't need much sleep and I don't have a, a come down period from that dopamine rush or that serotonin rush. I don't get the physical mental hangover or the, or the exhaustion. I just get the <laughs> hyped up realization that I haven't had another good idea. <laughs> The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I just don't, I just don't have any. Hmm. So easy. No, um, <laughs> I just do another thing, you know, like it's, it is easy to wallow in failure if, if something goes wrong. You know, when I moved to America, it was kind of on a whim and I didn't know what I was going to do. And so everything was exciting. Everything was a new big possibility and I didn't know where it was going to go. And then things kind of started to come together and things were on the right track. I'd signed on for three different ongoing series with two different publishers. The first series was out. I'd been in free comic book day twice. I was in it again. And this time it was going to have like literally my face on the cover of this book. And the order numbers for the last one had been like 60,000 copies. And like things genuinely felt like this is going to be something. People are going to know who I am. And that was really exciting. And then my new book was going to come out like a week later. And I was going to do a tour for two months, all these events. And everyone was going to be talking about it and blah, blah, blah. And that was 2020. I don't know if you know this. There's some stuff that happened then where everything fell apart. And it was really hard because... And I think a lot of people, I mean, by the way, oh no, my book didn't get as much promotion as I wanted is not the worst thing to happen to anyone during COVID, obviously. But it was a really hard time for me because I had spent three years working toward all of this stuff. And now was the point, like this was what everything had been building to. And then I had to look at it and go, what is it building to? There's nothing to look forward to now. And I think that's one of the hardest parts about this time in the world is that we get these little rushes of dopamine from a zoom party or hanging out like but we're not planning anything anymore the other day i started thinking like what am i going to do for for a, an event later this year and I, was like, I don't even want to start thinking about it because it'll probably have to be canceled something will go wrong and that's harder and i'm lucky because i make comics and i can make comics all by myself i can lock myself away in a room and i can draw pictures or i can write stories or I can write scripts. As long as I have a couple of those that are just for me, and that was what 
started Haunted Hill was that it was a book where I wasn't going to do any of the parts that other people would ask for. I hate waiting for notes. I get excited about a story and then I send off a script and then sometimes it's months before the editor gets around to looking at it depending, you know, when the book is due or whatever. And that's awful because then you have to dip back into it when you've stopped caring. And so Haunted Hill was this, I will write six pages in the morning and then I will immediately start drawing them. I'll do, I'll write six pages. I'll do the layouts. I'll start drawing it. Two, two days later, I have six pages of finished comic. Mm -hmm. It is hand colored with markers, mostly in grayscale with like some pops of color for surrealist sequences. It looks fucking cool. And then I scan it as a photograph so that nothing can even be altered digitally because I don't have the skill to alter those kinds of pictures. And it's why it has such a weird look to it and why probably going to have to stop if my scanner ever breaks because I've never found another scanner that can do that setting. Um, Epson WF7620, by the way, go into Epson Scan 1, set it on professional mode and click photo. It scans it like it's taking an actual photograph, not like it's scanning a photograph that you've already taken. And it gives you so much depth. It is wild. Like, it, I, I can't rant about that enough. Doing that that's how I deal with failure is that I, I just make it, you know, if, if that thing didn't go, then I make it, make the next thing. Nothing's ever going to stop me from making stuff unless my arms get cut off, I guess. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or artist, or maybe they would like to do something creatively that maybe you haven't touched on just yet. Maybe animation, who knows? How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think openness and availability is the most inspiring thing. I can look at things I really want to create. You know, like obviously everyone has works they look at and they go, man, I wish I created that. I wish I could create something as good as that, whatever. The one that's cool, like you, you make something really cool. That's awesome. But if you want to inspire people, then you have to be there and say, I'm a real person. Like you can do this too, because, because I did. Don't pretend like you've had good luck. Don't pretend like you were an overnight success. Don't pretend like you didn't put in the work because that makes other people feel like they can't measure up. The thing that pushed me to make more comics, I guess, or to like realize that my comics were good enough was that I was, you know, doing conventions and comic artists that I used to look up to were now sitting next to me and going to lunch with me and being my friends. And that's, it's weird. Uh, it's a it's a weird feeling to to be able to say, hey, seventeen year old Richard, you're really into Bills and Kevich right now, but like, what you don't know is that ten years from now the two of you will be going on a road trip together. Like, <laughs> that's a weird thing. I guess yeah, the way you can inspire people is to like take their work seriously. Don't tell them it's good if it's not or anything like that, but just take their work seriously and and take them seriously as a person. Don't don't be that person who pulls the ladder up behind you, and stop telling people things are good or bad. Just say they're different or interesting. I, I'm not going to, I don't want to name any no, names no, no. Uh, here, but like I've seen some comic artists who are technically very proficient. I've seen them say to people, you are not good enough at this thing. You are not good enough at that thing. And like, sometimes that's true. Like if you want to make Spider-Man books, you need to draw Spider-Man the way that Spider-Man looks. That's, that's how it goes. If that's what you want, then you do that. If you want to revolutionize Spider-Man by drawing him in a totally different way, then you have to do that and make it the best fucking thing in the whole wide world. That's cool too. But if you are the person who makes, and again, I'm not talking about anyone specific. I'm just using Spider-Man because I'm looking at a picture of him right now. Imagine if I was like, and that's why I hate an enlisted, I, can't, I don't even know who the artist is on any Spider-Man books. <laughs> if you are the artist on a mainstream superhero book and you look at someone who's doing some sloppy mess or some stick figures or some like photocopy zine thing or some weirdo abstract thing or an essay comic about the Simpsons. Treat work within the realm of what it is. Don't say you're not good enough to be a superhero artist because the truth is most superhero artists could not do what fucking Linda Berry does at all. Their work would suck by comparison. And it's the same as don't put, uh, I don't want my comics on the wall of an art gallery because I don't, they're not art. They're not the same thing because I'm not trying to make that thing. I'm not doing a, a nice painting. I'm doing a sloppy mess of a comic book or I'm doing a really fucking tight children story about like ghosts and monsters at a beach and it's going to look dope as fuck and nice and colorful and professional. Like it can be all those things. None of it is gallery art because that's not what I'm trying to do. Stop trying to judge things by a different criteria than they are wanting to be judged by. Don't criticize t-shirts for not being shoes. 
Well, Richard, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. This was great. I like our 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 uh, different backgrounds really do complement each other well. <laughs> I know. Yeah, the, the green and the, and the yellow. Yeah, for sure. Uh, before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you online and everything uh, like that? So I put out a buttload of free comics. Um, you can obviously you can buy anything you know, of mine through Amazon or you know any bookstore, any comic store. Everything is in Diamond, uh, Bland Beach, and Cardboardia are my two ongoing uh, all ages series. One is horror, one is low budget fantasy. On my website, richardfairgray.com, you can all my books uh, that are in print are available on Amazon or at bookstores or comic stores. Um, uh, Black Sand Beach and Cardboardia are my two kind of big ongoing all ages series. Black Sand Beach is, is a horror for kids. It's very, very good, very spooky. I'm working on the fourth book right now. And then I do a buttload of free comics online. Uh, richardfairgray.com has about 2000 pages of, of free stuff up there now. And I do six pages of Haunted Hill every Wednesday uh, for the foreseeable future. And uh, I promise I'll have a lot of new books out this year. I've got a new book coming out through Stack Deck Press called Ghost Ghost. I've got a new Black Sand Beach, a new Cardboardia, um, a book called Shed coming out through Blue Fox in July, I think. Uh, and uh, then a handful of new books for next year that haven't been announced yet. But Four Heller Heroes is the one to be excited about, I think. And All send right. me hot dogs. Send me hot dogs, please. <laughs> send me dirty old hot dogs. Just no ketchup, no tomato products, just dirty, dirty old hot dogs that I will eat and send you free comics. That ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking.